Hey, hey. Hello and welcome to Options Brew. I'm your host, Lex, and tonight's special guest is Mr. Dan Passarelli. Dan is a author, a trader, a former member of the CBOE and the CME. He's written two books, Trading Option Greeks and The Market Taker's Edge. He's the founder and CEO of Market Taker Mentoring, Inc., a global leader in options education. So let's get Dan out here. Dan, come on, turn your thing on there. Let's get you out here. A little applause for Dan. There he is. Look at that. Good to see you. How, how are things? Uh, things are great, Lex. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad you could make it. So um, you know how the show goes. We've already talked about it. So that's an easy one. Hey, you know, I'm so dark here. Let me move over. How's that? Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so we're going we're gonna to go through some things that you like to talk about. First of all, you know, um, you and I are from Chicago, right? So, well, you know, actually, we're not from Chicago. You're from the South side. I'm from the North side. So does that make you a Sox fan? Oddly enough, I'm one of the few South side Cubs fans. <laughs> oh, my God. That is odd. I'll tell you. And I kind of like the Sox, too. If they're playing the Cubs, I'll probably root for the Cubs. Um, but that's OK. Good. And then SIBO, right? You and I, like extinct animals, uh, practically from uh, CBOE days. There's not many of us left still doing this. Safe to say? Yeah, not, not too many at all. And the ones that were left, they, uh, they had some time off for a while, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we, we pat ourselves on the back. We're still around in the industry. Um, so what, tell me about that guitar. Man, you, I've seen you on Instagram, man. You're, you're jamming in some band. Are you, what, what's going on there? Yeah, I like to play, uh, play, play some music. Uh, that's kind of my outlet. Uh, play bass guitar. Uh, okay. Right here's my uh, Rickenbacker. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. And how long have you been doing that? All, all your life probably, right? Oh yeah. Long time. Uh, 30 <laughs> years, something like that, man. <laughs> oh God. That's awesome. Awesome. Okay. Let's talk about this. Uh, let's talk about these books first, huh? Um, so you're an author. Where, how'd that come about? Is that part of the gig with um, uh, market taker? What's, how did that come? What's going on there? Yeah. You know that, I mean, that was really one of my first forays into uh, in, into helping other traders um, bloom or Bloomberg actually asked me to uh, to write a book, and I was like, "Well, I don't, you know, what should I write about?" And I realized there was no book written out there on the Greeks, and so I was like, okay. "How is how, how's that possible?" You know. So, uh, so yeah, that was my first book, Trading Option Greeks. Okay, so the Greeks, um, I know what the Greeks are. You know what the Greeks are. What is that? You know, for these new traders, what's what's going on there? What what, what are the what's what's the Greeks? I like to liken the Greeks to, they're like the dashboard of your car. Okay. Uh, can you drive your car without looking at the dashboard? Eh, yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> not the best idea. Right. But, uh, you know, like they're your instruments, man. They, they tell you like, you know, hey, what's my risk? What's my potential reward? They can help you get into a trade, help you get out of a trade. They're super right. powerful. Good. Okay. So, and then the Greeks are Delta, Gamma, Theta, Vega, Rho, right? Yes. Um, any thoughts on the most important one uh, for, for, for you, newer traders, let's say? What's, what's critical? I definitely row, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I, I don't know how to spell row anymore. It's not <laughs> R-O-W, I know that. <laughs> um, well, definitely for most trade, well, okay, first I'll say all of them are important. Okay. Except row. Um, but Delta is clearly the most important. That's going to make or break most of your trades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then Theta and then Vega. Uh, gamma is important, but but I need to know mathematically, numerically, exactly what my Delta is on every trade, exactly what my Theta is on every trade. I need to okay. know my implied volatility. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily need to know my Gamma value, but I need to know the sign of it is positive or negative. Okay. Okay. So... Um... We were on our, in my floor days, we, you know, we, we, we carried positions, right? Inevitably. Um, so we had a lot of inventory of options all across the board. So, you know, row, for the viewers, row is probably not used as much as interest rate risk. Right. Um, but we had to take, keep track of that. The machines did that for us. Right. And in, in the real old days, we had to do it by hand and we had no idea what our row or Vega risk was. We kind of guessed. Um, but now there's a lot of tools out there that, that keep track of this for you. So you, you even teach all the way down for all these Greeks, probably not so much row, I'm assuming, but um, you, you really give a good mentoring of, of these sort of things, right? Yeah, the Greeks are uh, one of the things that are really at the heart of our program, the Greeks and volatility. Um, I mean, they're just, 
they're they're so important. I mean, they they guide all the decision making in all your option trading. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, and then so you, I think your service, the, the market taker mentoring, you do. Um, I think I understand you do one-on-one coaching. Tell us a little bit about that, that program. What are you doing there? And, and I, I thought I saw written up that you do some one-on-one stuff in live trader uh, rooms. Give us a little rundown on that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of our tenants is trading is personal. I mm-hmm. mean, everybody trades different. Um, you know, if I lined up the 10 best traders I know in a room, th- they're all going to have different styles, different risk tolerances, you know? Mm-hmm. And so like the, the cookie cutter courses where it's one size fits all, it, it usually doesn't fit any. Mm-hmm. So, so for the last 12 years, we've developed this system for one-on-one coaching where it's all personalized. We start people out with a personalized assessment, mm-hmm. um, you know, to, to learn what your risk tolerance is, to learn okay. what your goals are. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like I worked with one guy who's a 23 year old race car driver who wanted to be like crazy aggressive mm-hmm. and an 85 year old man who had a $10 million account and just wanted to conservatively grow it. Sure. Know? Okay. So, so we teach everybody differently. Uh, it's a six month program and mm-hmm. it, it, it is the fastest way to go from where you are now to where you need to be. Okay. And then can they, are they, is there, is there uh, do they watch you trade at all? Is there any of that where it's, it's live and they can, they can jump into a room and, and ask questions during the day? Yeah. And we do that in our group coaching class, which is, okay. really, yeah, it's really great. Uh, some people do both. Um, some people like the feel for just kind of, you know, being able to watch somebody trade live real time, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. That's, I, yeah, I find that important. Um, you know, the, you were a floor trader, right? Um, I was a floor trader. Making that transition from the floor to where we are now is difficult. It's difficult. So um, the, the, the advent of, of folks like you who are teaching others to trade, that's, that's, that's awesome. And it's really, really important. You know, I mean, Cal, sometimes even as, as, as long as I've been in the business, I look at the screen and I'm like, hmm. What am I going to do today? Um, but no, when you have a, when you have an idea, right? It's and you have a reason for the idea, and you have a good coach like that. It's I think it's vital. I think it's great. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think with a lot of things, it's important to have hands-on training. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, geez, I come up with any example. You know, like you're 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 making a recipe. You know, like if it's a, you know, like you read the recipe and you're like what's the difference between dice and, uh, you know, <laughs> mince or whatever, you know, right. <laughs> but if somebody shows you exactly how to do it, you're going to be able to do it and do it well. Right. Right. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Um, okay. So what are we going to talk about tonight? Let's talk about a couple of things here. You have some, uh, things on the list. Um, you, 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 you mentioned, uh, in the, in the pre-show a little, something about interest rates, inflation, the fed, what, what, give me some thoughts there. What are you thinking? Yeah. I mean, how do we not talk about that? Right. Yep. Um, So we had the Fed meeting. Those of you watching this live, we had the Fed meeting today Mm -hmm. and uh, Jerome Powell said that he was, that the Fed doesn't plan on raising interest rates until 2023 sometime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have interest rates down near zero for a while, but you know, the problem that that poses is that like, you know, there's no room to cut. Right. And you know, for those of you who uh, who follow this, like you know, you know that the reason we cut interest rates is to kind of s- stimulate the economy, uh, mm-hmm. make it easier for businesses to borrow money and and consequently grow. Mm-hmm. So it was interesting in the last Fed meeting, which was supported at this one, mm-hmm. that uh, the target uh, inflation rate, they're actually going to kind of be a little bit more open with that and they're going to target instead of keeping it below two percent keeping it at an average of two percent effectively allowing for more inflation right okay okay and can 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 how can a can, can a trader take advantage of this some way what's what's the is there a best way um to take advantage of a low interest rate environment with with certain stocks or not really what's your any thoughts there yeah i mean one of the one of the ways is you know i mean we look at it when we look at tech stocks. Mm-hmm. If you look at a lot of the tech stocks, I mean, a lot of them have been just on fire lately. Mm-hmm. And and some of them, like Amazon, it's because you know they're they're able to deliver their service in a way right. that a restaurant can't, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But another reason is those are traditionally growth stocks. Mm-hmm. 
And when interest rates are down near zero, these companies can borrow money for, for free. You know, I mean, they have to pay it back, but yep. <laughs> it's like no interest, you know? So, I mean, when a company that has the ability to grow and grow fast can just have all the capital they need to do it, you know, they can grow. Mm-hmm. So, so it, it, and that, some of this, this tech, you know, what, what seems like crazy rampant prices in, in the, in the heart of, of, a, of a COVID pandemic, right. Um, and these, these stocks uh, running back to where they were pre COVID, man, it's amazing. So maybe some of this interest rate stuff is kind of, kind of fueling this, this fire, huh? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that is a big part of it. Um, of course, you get to the point where stocks can't go up forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you get to the point where PE ratios, so I didn't look at Apple's PE ratio today, but I imagine it's similar to yesterday. What was it, about 30, uh, 36 or something? Mm-hmm. Uh, and Amazon's is 100 something, and Tesla's was 1,000. Oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, at some point it, it becomes unsustainable. And so people have to look at, well, okay, if these stocks can't go up anymore, uh, they might pull back to get down to where they should more realistically be valued. Mm-hmm. What should I buy? Mm-hmm. And it, in times like these, when the economy is doing poorly, which is unrelated to the market in, in a lot of ways, when the economy has, has done poorly and we're looking for a rebound, mm-hmm. what people go into is what's called cyclicals, which, which are okay. companies that just, you know, like more standard uh, um, value companies. Okay. Oh, any examples of one of those kind of companies to give a comparison? So we got, we have Amazon, Apple, Facebook on, on the tech side, right? Yeah. Um, what's a good uh, other version any, any, for, the, for the viewers? Yeah, people might uh, suggest something like um, like Nike or okay. maybe uh, looking at my list over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Target maybe sure. or something like that. Okay, yeah, which you know those stocks have done well too, right? Costco, tar- Target, um, like um, uh, essential stores kind of thing. It's they've gone crazy. Yeah, and it's been really interesting to watch how some of these companies reinvent themselves and have reinvented themselves through the the COVID thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Um, you've I, I know you and I talk, and you you, you bring up a lot. You bring up uh, volatility, right? Uh, and I'm, and I'm, you know, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, you, you bring up probably when we talk when you and I talk about volatility. We're probably referring to implied volatility of options generally, since we're, you know, that's our, that's in our DNA. Um, any thoughts on volatility? I know you, you, do you use the VIX at all? Is there anything going on with, with, you know, implied that you can, you can point to nowadays? What's, what's happening there? Yeah. I mean, uh, well, we can start with, we can start, well, I guess we were talking about tech. Uh, we'll segue into that, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, we, and we were talking about this a little earlier, Lex, uh, I found Apple's implied volatility picture to be really, really interesting lately. Okay, let me see if I can get something up here. Hold on a second. Go ahead, you keep talking. I'll, I'll pull this up. Great. Um, let me see if I can do this. I'm, I'm becoming a Zoom creature. <laughs> okay, so we've got an Apple. Uh, let me like, explain what this is for the folks here. Um, I get to draw too. This is so fun. I use my tools. Okay, so what we have is the red line. Okay, and that's this little guy here. That's that is historical volatility of the underlying product Apple. Okay, what does that mean? Close to close measures of how Apple moves. There's other measures that you can look at. We're just going to keep this simple intraday overnight. We're not going to talk about crazy stuff right now. Let's just keep it close to close. That's this red line here. I've chosen an implied volatility 60. That's a 60 day rolling implied volatility that's the white line then now dan to use 60 30 is there is there a better number for you to for me to click on it depends what i'm looking at i typically look at the 30 day implied okay then let's do that let me get out of here and do 30 so i just clicked off 60 i clicked on 30 so uh and by the way it looks like we got a couple zero points so don't pay attention to those i don't know why those are there but they're no good so those would probably be in that range anyhow okay so I, i got 30 now go ahead i'm sorry yeah, so so what's really interesting about volatility, uh, you'll 
and, and we can talk a little bit more about this next, maybe if we have time uh, about the VIX, mm -hmm. but you'll hear people say that, um, that implied volatility can be a, a directional indicator. And, and when stocks go up, implied volatility goes down. And that's true about 80% of the time, but not always. Mm -hmm. And if you look here, because uh, I think Lex, oh, and trade your platform, excellent. Uh, yep. Glad we're using that. Yep. If this, you, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was, I was just gonna say, this is, just so the folks know, this yellow line is the stock price, okay? So I just drew over it so we know what we're talking about, okay? I forgot to mention that when I was explaining, but go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So like, like, so take a look at that, you know, uh, you know, the white is the implied volatility and the, and the gold line is the stock price. They move together for, geez, how long is that? I mean, a good month or something like yeah, that. Yeah. So yeah, let me show where, where we're talking. So this part here, this white part is, is incline increasing, sorry, as the stock's increasing. That's pretty unusual in, in the industry, in the options trading business. It's not impossible. Obviously it's doing it here. Um, but what's interesting is that, you know, Apple did split. We know that, right? Um, volatility went up as Apple went up. Now, you know, you and I know from the trading days that could happen in volatile up moves, right? It could happen, but typically we don't see that. So there's a little disconnect, I think, is what you're saying here. Is that right? Yeah, it's a disconnect. And, and, and for, you know, for the people who pay attention to this, it points to an opportunity where, you would think that people were a lot more likely to believe that Apple would come down, that it was overpriced and overbought because mm -hmm. of the split. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And then what about the VIX? Do you follow that at all? So what about the VIX, which is kind of a, you know, a market sort of barometer of, they, I think Kramer always calls it the fear index on TV, right? So that's what we all refer to it as. Anything unusual going on in the VIX at all? You follow that at all? Anything happening there? Yeah, so looking at the VIX, I'm pulling it up uh, <clears throat> on my end a little bit here as well. Yeah, let me see if I, can get, I got the screen share on covering everything. Let me just see if I can get that up too. I don't know if it will. You, you pulling yours up on your side too? Uh, yeah, yeah, but I, I'd rather look at it on your platform if okay, you're able see, to. I, I might have to do VIXX uh, if, I'm, if I'm, I can't remember. Yeah, close let enough. Let me see. It might be VXX. Well, us. I mean, either way, it's, I mean, it's a little bit interesting too. I mean, there we went through about a 12 year period, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken, where if the VIX got over 10, it was like a Christmas miracle. Right. Oh my God. Tell me about it. Right. <laughs> I know. I mean, you can see it here. This is just the VXX, which is, is going to be a little higher generally, but I mean, here's the lows right down here. Yeah. 20, 20, 20 ish. Right. I mean, this it, it's yeah, what I remember. So back in the day, it, it, it was eight. You know, I, I remember eight VIX. I remember yeah. 10 VIX was kind of standard. When it got to 15, you're like, oh, my God, what's going on? Yeah. Right. I'm getting a nosebleed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I mean, now, I mean, we haven't seen the VIX below 20 really in a freaking long time. Yeah, it's been a while. And, and we've we've actually had times, I think, correct me if I'm wrong um same deal uh market going higher vix going higher yeah that always scares me right because that shouldn't happen typically and now when that happens i'm like uh oh is that kind of a a precursor to a market fall or anything i mean that could that happen or i guess anything could happen but is that kind of a you know kind of the the, the tea leaves telling us something yeah, yeah I, there's a little bit to that you know um what people typically do is is they look at the opposite Mm -hmm. You know, they look at it like, oh, uh, the VIX is the VIX is going down, so the market should be going up, and VIX is going up, so the market should be going down, and mm -hmm. that can, <clears throat> excuse me, that can be really dangerous. People can get caught into that trap, mm -hmm. and 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 this is like, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Right. Right. <laughs> Good. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, okay. Let me get back. Let me get back out of that. Let's get back on uh, on our show here. Good deal. Okay. Good. Um, what about, um, you, you mentioned in our little chat before, and you mentioned about uh, covered calls. Yeah. What, what do you want to chat about there? That, so let me just say, let me say a couple of things first. Covered calls. I mean, I'll explain what it is. You tell me about them. So covered calls. So people who own stocks, right? They own, they own the actual stock equity. 
they tend, they can sell calls against that product, against the stock. And what does that do? It generates income typically. So what, when you sell a call, that, that theta, that wastes away, you're generating income against your stock position, right? Now to you and me, we know what that means. That's a synthetic, you know, short put scariness, but uh, we're not gonna talk about that tonight. Um, but it's a good, it's a good program, right? So what, what, what do we need to tell the folks about how that works? Anything, um, especially in this market, because it's kind of volatile. Yeah. Yeah. We work with a lot of our investing uh, mm -hmm. students with covered calls uh, as opposed to trading students. Yep. And covered calls in this market, <clears throat> some people have had a rough time with them, especially folks who chose like further out covered calls, like uh, like like a three months ago selling a three month out covered call, mm -hmm. um, like giving that much time in a market that had this potential momentum that actually came to fruition and got to such a high level, mm -hmm. you know, it ended up being tricky because what happens is when a stock, you know, like if you bought, I mean, if you bought a stock or the spiders here mm -hmm. and it went down to here with COVID and you decide to start selling calls here, well, a lot of times you get assigned and right. Yeah, you know, you end up selling your stack, giving up all that upside, and and it, and it doesn't work. Yeah. So what? So it, you know, that, c c the folks can when they when that happens right before expiration, they can roll that out, right? So they can roll that short call out to another at the money and beyond, to to, to avoid that exercise. So so just to explain, um, when that when that call goes in the money and you're short it and you're long the stock and it's it, it expires, you're going to get assigned. So the short shares from your call will offset that long share and you're, you're out of your position. But there's a role that we can do, right? Do you, do you guys teach that at all? Do you do any of that? Yeah, we teach it and it is extremely important. Okay, good. Uh, I, I mean, I literally just had this scenario uh, three weeks uh, three weeks ago or so, I wanna say, where uh, you know I sold a co uh, covered call. I forget what strike it is, maybe mm -hmm. 151. What stock was that? In the SPY, in the spiders. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, I want to say it was, or uh, oh, like off oh, a complete freaking handle over here. Like the, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it was like the three fifty fifty ones or something, and it got up above there, and and we you know we ended up getting up to like three fifty eight, and so what did I you know I was I was making money on the shares, but I was losing money on the call. Mm -hmm. And that is such a dangerous mindset for folks who are new to this because they say, oh no, I'm losing money on the call. This is terrible. I'm going to hang on to that call because God forbid, I don't want to lose money on that call. Sure. Right. And, right. Yeah. Instead of, and, and here's, here's another suggestion for one of the viewers throughout. Let me, let me, let me share my screen again. Uh, okay. Here we go. Okay. So we can see this, right? Yep. So the, the suggestion is too, which is absolutely correct. Uh, you could, you could certainly it, let's pretend, and I'm just going to point the calls are on the left here. So this is an option chain. So let's pretend we're short this Apple call, right? And the Apple stock is 112, and all of a sudden we run up, and this call's in the money, right? We're trading up here. What can you do? Well, you can roll this call out to another month. Okay, we can do that. The other thing you can do is you can take that call and roll it up. So, you know, you can, you can certainly do that. So you'd buy in your short, roll it up if you want. You can do it within the same month, right? Is that, is that a teaching strategy or at all? Or would you rather just roll it out? Uh, could be either. It depends how much time is left in the life of the option that you have. Okay, good point. That's a great point. Yeah, if there's, if there's a lot of time, I prefer to stay within the same expiration if I can. Okay. Uh, what's nice is with products like spiders, I mean, they, the options expire every couple of days. So I can, you know, kind of, kind of split the difference and maybe cheat a little bit and sell two days more time. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and the whole trick is like what I, what I think Lex is getting at here. The whole trick is, you know, if I've lost two bucks on my covered call, well, actually the, the covered call that I had a few weeks ago, I was, I lost three bucks on it. Right. right? Sold it at whatever it was, uh, uh two and, and I bought it back at five, lost three bucks, mm -hmm. but I sold, I want to say it was maybe the 361 calls. Okay. Collected three bucks. I collected that $3. Right. And right. then when the spiders came back down, well, that, that $3 that I lost was offset by that three bucks I made. And what ended up happening, you know, I mean, I bought spiders way lower by, well, actually selling cash cured puts during mm -hmm. the, the, 
you know, the downturn. Sure. And so I got to keep all that share appreciation and not make or lose anything on my calls. And, and that's a win, man. Oh, that's good. That's good. Now, do you teach, um, do you, do you go into iron condors at all? Any of that stuff? Is that part of the plan with, with your group? Yeah. Um, like, like one of our big tenants is you will be more successful if you, if you match the strategy to the opportunity. Okay. You know, yep. like I was just working with a guy today who he was, he was getting pretty good at just buying calls. Okay. And I said, well, that's great. But you know, what do you do in the market just isn't moving, you know, in this one particular stock? Mm-hmm. Um, what do you do when it's going down? What do you do when it's just going to, you know, you think it's just going to go up a little bit, sure. maybe debit call spread might be better than a long call because you'll make more in risk class. Okay, great. Yeah. So, so yeah, we like to teach, uh, I mean, like a, a full breadth of strategies. So you have more tools in your toolbox, if you will, you can trade more different types of markets and you can trade better strategies for every opportunity. Okay, great, great. Um, that's awesome. So, um, let's, let's do a couple questions. What do you think? Sound Sounds good? Great. Yeah. So someone asked, what pit did you trade in? Believe uh, it or not. I was in the Ford motor company pit. That was the main stock, right? Any other little berries in there besides Ford? Uh, yeah, there was uh, let's see, there's carnival cruise lines. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really good. Uh, with, with the, with the way it moves, right? Yeah, uh, or at least the way it moved, I should say. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Carnival Cruise Lines, okay. USAI. Uh, Trying to think what. Oh, uh, AT and T. Okay. Started yeah. out at Maritech, I think, when I was first. Right. Year. Right. Okay. Yeah, the the good old days of the floor, right? Um, someone's asking, uh, do you ever do you ever use uh, put credit spreads? So do you ever do you use those at all? Is that a good strategy? Yeah, it's a good strategy when the situation presents itself. And so let's let's talk about that. There's mm-hmm. a couple of good things about put credit spreads. Okay. Basically, you use them when when there's support on on the stock. Okay. When you feel that the stock won't fall below a certain point, it doesn't have to go up, mm-hmm. but just your thesis is that it's not going to go down below a certain point because there's support there. Right. Okay. But, but the other criterion is you want implied volatility to be high okay, uh, because you're selling options. And when implied volatility, uh, when implied volatility is in the top half of the six month range and it's above mm-hmm. historical. Good those, time for that. Yeah. Yeah. It can be. Yeah. So yeah, well, that's right. That's a good point. So w- we, as traders, what we like to see, and as Dan said, we like to high volatility is good for selling, but there's a little catch volatility is high for a reason because things are probably moving around a lot. Right. So, you know, I always got myself in trouble on that on the floor. I was like, okay, mm-hmm. great. High volatility, free money right now. Nah, it's not actually free. You got to work a little hard at it sometimes. <laughs> um, the good point here though, that Dan makes is that he said something uh, earlier when he said that is when you find a support level. Right. And that's kind of the, the you know, people have different ways of read, reading the, the tea leaves and s- people will use charts and what have you. And, and it, that that's, that's can be important. So if you have a, a strong opinion about support, high volatility, great time to use that, that put credit spread, right. Or, you know, the opposite way would be a call credit spread, right. If we're, we're up at resistance, let's call it. Um, so terrific, terrific tools. Now, in the in our days, we were able to sell probably naked puts and calls, right? We got to do that because we had so much leverage. Mm-hmm. Today's uh, retail trader probably not as uh, able to do that. So that's why we combine it with the long side of that put, or the other side of that put to protect it. And on the call side, the upper call would be, would protect that, right? Um, and I'm sure you teach that, you know, for safety reasons more than anything, right? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like I said before, every strategy has a time and a place. Um, I like, you know, I like sometimes, especially in my investing side, selling cash secured puts to intentionally acquire stock. Okay. But what does that mean? Just so, just as a definition, cash secured puts, can you, can you, what does that mean? Yeah. So, so I might sell, okay, so I'll sell a put. Mm -hmm. And if I sell a put, what's one thing that can happen if the stock goes down, Mm -hmm. I could get assigned and have to buy the stock. Okay. Well, 
where's the money coming from? You know, if I'm just really leveraging that account, I sold a whole bunch of puts, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I can sell a lot, but I might not have money in the, in the account to buy the stock mm -hmm. that I've got a sign that I, that I, I'm, I have to buy. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I hold cash. I secure the future purchase of that stock with mm -hmm. cash. Okay. So essentially you're protecting yourself uh, down to zero more or less by being secured. Yeah. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. I can still lose, Sure. but the, you know, that's why I do this only in an investing account. And I think about that cash secured put as if it's a stock that I, that, that I'm buying, you know, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. like I own stocks, I own individual stocks and also ETFs in my IRA. I mean, everybody does. What happens if those go to zero? Well, you lose mm -hmm. a bunch of money. Right? You lose a bunch. That's right. <laughs> right. And so, and so, so that's why I really only do cash cured puts for the most part mm -hmm. uh, in, in my investing account, and and just think of it as if okay, I'm I'm kind of buying these shares. It's a little different. Right. 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 Good. So, question. Couple questions. Um, uh, but, but, but cash secured puts. Do you ever? So this person used the wheel. I think that means selling the call against it once you get once you get assigned. So do you ever go ahead and do that? Is that is that a strategy? Yeah, I, I like to call that one the recycle trade. <laughs> that's that's scrambling, right? Keep your head above <laughs> keep, keep treading for water. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, but oh man, that can be great. You know, yeah, and, and that's basically what I did in spiders uh during COVID. You know, I was largely in cash at the top, yep. uh, sold puts as was going down. Don't get me wrong. I didn't, you know, get all assigned at the bottom, you know, yeah. um, you know, bought some here and some more here and some more here sure. from, from assignment. Okay. Then when it started going back up, then I started selling calls against yep. and, and you're just collecting premium as it goes down and it, as it goes up. Right. Okay, good, good. Um, I'm going to launch the poll uh, while we're talking. Okay. So viewers, you can, it's three questions. So you, you'll just, You'll get it and I'll, I'll leave it on for a little while. But if you'd fill that out, it'd be great. Um, next question, uh, butterflies, butterflies. So I was a big butterfly trader. I didn't, you know, I, we, we didn't really, I didn't try to do one by two by ones. It was, it, it amounted to a butterfly ultimately, right? Um, so do, what do you think about butterflies? And again, I, I know it, it probably relates to volatility, et cetera, but in, the, in your strategy, but anything come to mind with butterflies? Someone's asking. Yeah, there's a, there's, I, I'm going to share with you one great tip. This is the best tip I can give you for butterflies. Uh, never trade them with more than 10 days until expiration. Never trade them. Let me think about that. With more than 10 days expiration. Okay, go. I get it now. Right, right. Okay. Because here's the thing. If you look at a butterfly, so I, I'm a big Greek guy, have to be. If you look at a butterfly with like six weeks until expiration or something mm -hmm. like that, the, you know, if you do it at the money, your delta is going to be zero, your mm -hmm. gamma, your theta, your vega, it's all going to be zero. Right. The, they all offset each other. So what does that mean? That means it's impossible to make any money and, and unlikely to lose any money unless there's a big move and then you can lose. So, mm -hmm. so the only thing that can happen until you get within about 10 days is you can possibly lose money. Okay. Uh, but then when you're within 10 days, okay, now we're starting to get some actual theta. Now I can actually make a little bit of money on these trades. So, so that is a great tip. Right. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, you know, and then, and then you get into the, the whole gamut of um, uh, iron butterflies. We won't talk about that, but there's, there's, it becomes crazy condors, you know, you can do all kinds of crazy things then. Yeah. Um, so we've got a brokerage question. I'm gonna let Andre handle that with uh, the chat. We, we don't like to talk about brokerage things. <laughs> <laughs> no, we love talking about brokerage, uh, but we're gonna we're gonna deflect that to the broker people. Um, all right, I'm looking through this uh, thing. So let me just see here. Hold on, I'm looking through our poll. Cool, cool, cool. Excellent, excellent. Good, good. Um, okay, good. One more question, unless you have some other things. No, no, go. I love questions. Let's do you, it. You love questions? Okay. Um, scary. This uh, I don't know where this came from, but scariest day of trading in your life. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, how how long have you been in the business? I, I mean, from the trading side. Uh, well, I started trading in 1998. Okay, okay. So you've seen a lot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. So was there is there a scariest day? I, mean, I don't know what they mean, but I'm assuming where you uh, 
you know, yeah, one of those like, oh my God, this isn't going well. Uh, yeah, I mean, had a few of those. Um, <clears throat> I mean, one, I was trading this stock network associates where it was trading at, uh, which doesn't exist anymore, by the way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Foreshadowing. <laughs> But trading at 22 bucks a share, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, hey, no problem. Short a lot of downside puts, but those are like 20% out of the money. Right. <laughs> Come in one day and it's trading at 11 because oh, it's in the, the books. Oh. And it's like, oh, crap. Oh, there's $200,000. Yeah, yeah, not good, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chime in on this one myself because I've had some really we're crazy. We were DPMs, right? So that means we had to, we had to be there. Um, so that was really scary. Um, Google earnings came out before the, the close at 258. So people, just so you know, in the old days, the, you know, it's still in the, still in the, the current days, we close at three o'clock central time. 258 the earnings came out. Google goes crazy. We're the specialists and we're on what we call an automated system back on the trading floor back then. And we got hit on over 500 orders in a matter of seconds. I mean, are you kidding me? I, I can't tell you that it wasn't good. I mean, we just totally got, got picked off. So that was, that was really bad, but um, we had some good ones too. So, you know, we mixed the good and the bad. All right, Dan. Well, that's great. Great show. Thanks for coming on. We'll do it again for sure. Um, Andre market taker, I'm looking in the chat here, market taker mentoring. It's in there. Perfect. Uh, your call. You want to talk about any prices about market taker mentoring? You don't have to, but if you want to talk about it, how they get there, they go to the website. They, I'm assuming they sign up. Are there different levels of packaging, et cetera, that you, you want to give your call? Yeah. Head on over to our website. We're actually launching a new website tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> perfect timing, but, uh, but visit us. And we're actually offering for right now, anyway, a free mm -hmm. membership. Uh, so oh, nice. yeah, so definitely, well, I mean, the market's closed right now anyway. So just yep. put a little note and come on over to markettaker.com tomorrow and uh, get a free membership. All right. Awesome. Well, Dan, thanks so much. Um, great talking to you, Dan Passarelli, markettaker.com, right? Um, go there, be there. Uh, great show, man. Thanks. Talk yes. soon. It's fun. Thanks. All right. Bye now.